Shabbat Shalom to all of you out there. This week's Torah portion, Va'era, in the book of Exodus. We read about the first plagues in Egypt. And as even our preschool children know, one of the afflictions was frogs. Kids love singing that frog song, you know, frogs here, frogs there, frogs are jumping everywhere. We give them these little toy frogs, and they gleefully imagine the Sicilians emerging from the Nile, creaking, croaking, and crawling into every corner of Egypt. The Torah states, and God said to Moses, say to Aaron, hold out your arm with the rod over the rivers, canals, and ponds, and bring up the frogs from the land of Egypt. The rabbis noticed that the word frog, tzvardea, is written in the singular. Vata'al ha literally, and the frog came up and covered the land. A couple of verses later, the Torah uses the plural, hatsvardeim. But in the verse that launches the plague, frog is written in the singular. Naturally, the rabbis wanted to know why. What is the reason that the Torah first describes the frogs in the singular, literally, the frog emerged from the water, and only afterwards, when masses of them began croaking around Egypt, are they mentioned in the plural? Is it literally true, they asked? Was it only one frog at first who came out of the water? The Talmudic sage Rabbi Elazar expounded, it is literally true. Tzvardea echat haita. It was one frog. But you know, in the Talmud, you can't only have one opinion without an argument. It just doesn't sit well with Jews. So sure enough, centuries later, Talmudic rabbis recall this verse as having sparked a debate between Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Akiva. How did one frog manage to organize a massive invasion of all the other frogs? Rabbi Akiva said, Hishritza. The one frog spawned, created, fathered, reproduced all the other frogs. Rabbi Elazar disagreed. And he responded to Akiva, you know, with this kind of salty rabbinic language. He said to Akiva, you know what, Akiva, stick to what you know. Your specialty is halacha. Jewish law. Stick to that. Your specialty is not agada, which is non-legal exegesis. Non-legal exegesis is my field, said Rabbi Elazar. So I will tell you, Akiva, what really happened there. It's not that one frog spawned all the other frogs. It's that one frog, sharkalahem, one frog whistled to them beckoned to them, and then they all came. What's the difference between Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Akiva? According to Akiva, all the frogs came from one parent frog. Almost like one frog had a sort of genetic mutation and birthed such a mass of poisonous frogs that in no time Egypt was covered in them. But Elazar disagreed with Akiva. According to Elazar, it wasn't that one frog gave birth to all the other frogs. All the other frogs were already there. All that the lead frog had to do was to whistle to them, to marshal them, to organize them, and they came eager to spread their poison. Now, if you're not steeped in Jewish learning, you might skip over this brief debate entirely. 
I know other congregations that the congregants don't care, but I know that you care. You're familiar with this. But you could ask, like, who cares who was right? One sp frog spawned the other frogs, or one frog whistled to all the other frogs. What does it matter? Either way, millions of frogs came and covered the land of Egypt. But actually, this one seemingly innocuous Talmudic debate contains an enormous idea. How does a community decline? How was the glory of the ancient Near East, the mighty empire of Egypt, how was Egypt brought to its knees? One view, Akiva's view, is that one hateful person over time fills the land with poisonous ideas. It all comes from this one person. He is the progenitor of poison. He plants in the masses ideas that were never there. One person filled with noxious ideas instills venom in millions of others. He fathers it. He creates it. He spawns it and implants it, poisoning so many hearts and minds. Sooner or later, they crawl out of all the rivers, canals, and ponds where they reside and cover every corner, crack, and crevice of the land, spreading poison in their wake. The other view, Elazar's view, also affirms the power of one person, one leader. But this view contends that the poison is already there. There are millions of poisonous frogs in the world. They exist in nature. They were created that way, poisonous. There are millions of toxic human beings in the world. We were created this way. All of us are filled with hate, animosity, resentment, animus, prejudice, loathing, malice, contempt, bigotry, chauvinism, xenophobia. We all have that potential in us. It already exists in the human creature. That's how we were made. No one spawns them in us. We have these qualities. We have these, this potential already in us. You have these impulses too. Human beings are a mixture of good and bad, love and hate, charity and animosity, peace and war. It's not that one person creates in us these Toxicants. Rather, according to Elazar, one person releases these toxicants, gives them permission to come out into the world. All it takes to cover the land with venom is one leader, one person who whistles to all of the others, one person who allows for, releases these pent up and pent in emotions. One person who exploits our natural human proclivity to fear the other, to dominate the other. One person who is so persuasive, so charismatic, so convincing that he inspires multitudes and assures them it's safe to come out of the dark corners where you reside. One person who exhorts, now's the time. We've been waiting for this day for a long time. Our place is not in the dark nether world of murky rivers, muddy canals, and marshy ponds. Come out, come out now into the sunshine. One person who deadens the principle of right and wrong by the constant attrition of excess. One person who whistles, come out, come out, wherever you are. He doesn't even have to say it explicitly. They have a special language. They understand their code language. It doesn't have to be a, an express whistle. Dog whistles do the trick. 
Both Akiva and Elazar agree that one person has the power to motivate millions. One person can make a difference. The dispute between them is that Akiva implies that Pharaoh had to work hard to instill into the Egyptians hateful xenophobic ideas. He kept pounding away until over time, Egypt was covered in darkness. Elazar, on the other hand, implies that Pharaoh didn't have to create the poison. It was already there, just waiting for its chance to come out of the shadows. Pharaoh didn't concoct the poison. He released it. He gave it permission to climb out of the swamp and infect the land. What do you think? Who was right? Akiva or Elazar?